This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Grace to you and peace in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And welcome to worship at the First Presbyterian Church of Warminster. And a special welcome to those who worship with us through WRDV FM radio. Today's flowers are dedicated to the glory of God by Sue and Daniel Murphy and their family in loving memory of Sue's mother, Ruth Wheatley, and by Sue Durkis in memory of her mom and dad. Our prayer requests for today are for Carla, for baby Nadia, and for Peggy as she recovers from surgery, and also for Dan and Peggy Clark, whose dear friend and our former church secretary died this past week after a long illness. So please keep Dan and, Peg and Peggy in your prayers. Today's liturgist is Linda H. Our musical gifts are offered by Kathy Worth Balkus on organ and piano. Hymns are sung by our choir and the congregation and our chime players are Rita, Sarah, Keith, June, Amy, and Joe, conducted by our director of music, Dave Sadra. Worship begins with the sounding of the chimes. Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Worship continues with the prelude.
Before turning to scripture, let us pray. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. I'll be reading this morning from Ruth 1, chapter 1, verses 1 to 18. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem in Judah went to live in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Emelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Malan and Chilion. They were Ephraimites from Bethlehem in Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives. The name of one was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. When they had lived there about ten years, both Malan and Chilion also died, so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. Then she started to return with her daughters-in-law from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had considered his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she had been living, she and her two daughters in law, and they went on their way to go back to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughters in law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find security, each of you, in the house of your husband. Then she kissed them, and they wept aloud. They said to her, No, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Do I still have sons in my womb that may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. Even if I thought there was hope for me, even if I should have a husband tonight and bear sons, would you then wait until they were grown? Would you then refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, it has been far more bitter for me than for you, because the hand of the Lord has turned against me. Then they wept aloud again. Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. So she said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not press me to leave you or to turn back from following you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. There will, there will I be buried. May the Lord do thus and so to me and more as well, if even death parts me from you. What then when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more to her. Psalm 146. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God all my life long. Do not put your trust in princes, in mortals, in whom there is no help. When their breath departs, they return to the earth. On that very day their plans perish. Happy are those whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord their God, who made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, who keeps faith forever, who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the strangers. He upholds the orphan and the widow, but the way of the wicked he brings to ruin. The Lord will reign forever. Your God, O Zion, for all generations. Praise the Lord.
Hebrews chapter 9, verses 11 to 15. But when Christ came as a high priest of the good things that have come, even through the greater and perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy place, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls with the sprinkling of the ashes of a heifer sanctifies those who have been defiled so that their flesh is purified, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to worship the living God. For this reason, he is the mediator of a new covenant so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance because a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions under the first covenant. Our gospel lesson is from Mark chapter 12, verses 28 through 34. One of the scribes came near and heard them disputing with one another. And seeing that Jesus answered them well, he asked him, which commandment is the first of all? Jesus answered, the first is here, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Then the scribe said to him, you are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one, and besides him there is no other. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding, with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself. This is much more important than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. After that, no one dared to ask him any question. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Whenever I hear the word widow in scripture, I think of my maternal grandmother. Her name was Cora Lee Plyler. And in her 85 years, she lived through two world wars and the Great Depression. She lived through other calamities because she was widowed twice. Her first husband died in his 20s when a ruptured appendix developed into sepsis, leaving her with two young daughters. Her second husband, my grandfather, died in old age from complications of stroke and she survived him another 18 years. Together they had raised 10 children, which meant that she was rarely alone and was well cared for in her widowhood. Hardly a day went by without one of her children or grandchildren or great-grandchildren stopping by her house for a visit and to help her with her chores. My grandmother never learned how to drive, but she had plenty of chauffeurs and she loved her church. She and my grandfather were pillars of their congregation. And to this day, I cannot sing the Gloria Patri without her image popping into my mind. Nor can I look at a large print Bible or upper room devotional guide without thinking of her. I also think of my mother who was widowed in her early 60s and how she leaned on her faith as she grieved for my father 
and how she found comfort and renewal in pouring herself into helping others through her church and through her community volunteer work. I'm sure many of you have similar stories to share about your mothers and grandmothers or other women you know who were widowed yet who still led lives full of faith and meaning after their husbands died. And in the church, widows have been given special attention since New Testament times. For example, the book of Acts tells us that the reason why the ministry of deacons was established in the early church was to make sure that the widows were getting their share of food. And in other parts of the New Testament, widows are lifted up as examples of discipleship, such as in Paul's first letter to Timothy, where he mentions that widows performed special ministries in the church, such as intercessory prayer and acts of compassion. Such positive images of widows have been handed down to us throughout history of the church that we tend to forget that in ancient Israel and in the time of Jesus, the word widow carried far more negative connotations than positive ones. In biblical times, a woman's survival depended 100% on her having a father, a husband, or a son to protect and to provide for her. There were no safety nets to sustain them when their husbands or sons died. Women had no inheritance rights in those days. So unless a male relative of her husband's was willing to marry her or take her into his home, a widow depended entirely on the charity of her community, which didn't always happen. And the leaders didn't always make sure that it was happening. So being a widow in that time meant exposure to poverty, hunger, exploitation, and death. She was completely on her own unless others intervened to save her. And it's for this very reason that scripture tells us that God has a special concern for widows as well as others who are also vulnerable to being forgotten or abused by society, namely orphans, the poor, and sojourners, which is biblical shorthand for migrants and refugees like Naomi and her family. And we just heard the same value in today's Psalm. The Lord watches over the strangers. He upholds the orphan and the widow. The way of the wicked he brings to ruin. God is so passionate about the vulnerable that he commands that we care for them because God knows that sin will always distort our sense of who deserves our love and our care. As you heard, the story of Ruth is about widows. It begins with Naomi who at the beginning of the story is fortunate to live under the protection of a husband and two sons. And during a severe famine, she migrates with her family from Israel to the land of Moab. After Naomi's husband dies, her sons marry Moabite women, Orpah and Ruth. And for a time, Naomi's future looks pretty bright. She has two sons to look after her and two daughters-in-law to bear grandsons to continue the bloodline and to keep her husband's property in the family. But then both of her sons die, leaving their wives widowed and childless 
and they are left alone with Naomi to fend for themselves. They may as well have been given a death sentence. And when the famine in Israel comes to an end, Naomi decides to go back home. And her two daughters-in-law want to go with her, but she urges them to stay in Moab and return to their families. They are still young, she tells them, and have a good chance at finding new husbands to protect them. But Ruth, forsaking all opportunity to make a better life for herself, refuses to let Naomi face her bleak future alone and insists on sticking with her speaking those now famous words, where you go, I will go, where you live, I will live, your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. This quote is so famous, it's made its way into wedding liturgies and has been set to music. But the full passage indicates how dangerous a risk Ruth is taking by staying with Naomi when she goes on to say this, where you die, I will die. There will I be buried. Knowing that both of them without the protection of husbands or sons are very likely to die in the not too distant future, Ruth is determined that if Naomi's future will lead her through suffering and death, at least she won't go through that alone. Scripture also tells us that God wants everyone to experience that same force of love that Ruth shows toward Naomi because God is love. And as we heard Reverend Na preach last week from 1 Corinthians, Divine love is not a disembodied emotion, as though God only feels love for us from a distance. God loves us by drawing near and by taking action, by sustaining us, by guiding and nurturing us, by teaching and correcting us, and by sending his son to save and to strengthen us so that we can truly live. And not only that, we are commanded to share the love we receive from God with our neighbor, especially the neighbor in need. The neighbor who the world tells us is not worthy of our compassion. As Jesus tells the scribe in today's gospel lesson, we are closest to the kingdom of God when our love of God and love of neighbor are one and the same. Ruth certainly lived close to the kingdom. And so do we whenever we take risks by putting the needs of the vulnerable before our own needs. Because that is exactly how Christ lived for us. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Amen.
Let us turn our hearts to the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. God of glory, we praise you for your presence in our lives and for all the goodness that you shower upon your children. Especially we thank you for promises kept and hope for tomorrow, for the enjoyment of friends, the wonders of your creation, for the love we receive and share with our parents, our sisters and brothers, our spouses and children and neighbors. God of grace, we are one with all your children. We are sisters and brothers of Christ and we offer our prayers for all whom we know and love, for Nadia, Peggy, Carla, and for Dan and Peggy as we share their burden of grief over the death of their dear friend and our former church secretary, Leslie Hoagland. And Lord, we pray for those we too often forget, people who have lost hope, victims of tragedy and disaster, those who suffer mental anguish, and those whom we now name before you in our hearts. Loving God, you are the wellspring of life. So pour into our hearts the living water of your grace, that we may be refreshed to live this day in joy, confident of your presence, and empowered by your peace. Through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together.
And now may we go in peace to love and serve the Lord and to love and serve our neighbor. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forever. Oh.